Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a talk about Tezos, the self amending cryptographic ledger. Uh, before I even get started, uh, could I just get a hand raised in the audience? How many people of you have heard or even um, uh, played a little bit with Bitcoin? Okay, most people. How about Ethereum? All right, okay, a trickier one. How many of you have heard of reentrancy bugs in the Ethereum language? All right, great, awesome. Okay. So I, I have to go a little fast because it's, uh, to give this talk, I have to give you basically three talks. Um, and even though I have four bullet points here, it's really three talks mostly. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the concept of a blockchain. Uh, what is the concept of an abstract blockchain? Uh, we're going to talk about the paradox of self-amendment and how that relates to governance. Um, some considerations in the design of smart contracts, languages, uh, and a little bit uh, I'll talk about defensive programming uh, in OCaml. So, What's a blockchain? It's a concurrent data structure representing a shared, mutable singleton, right? People say blockchains are immutable. What they mean is that the record is, immu uh, is uh, immutable, but the um, operations on a blockchain actually change it. And the way we represent it is uh, through a linked list of blocks of operations. Uh, briefly speaking, we have, there's two kinds of data structures in the world, immutable and mutable. Um, the immutable data structure, um, uh, are also known sometimes as append only, so a single immutable value is a trivial example. Uh, simply linked list, you just add uh, more elements to your list, uh, trees, and some typically aren't like a double linked list. You need to be able to modify uh, a pointer in uh, already existing value in order to do that. So how do we represent uh, immutable data structure with immutable data structure? Well, we have a simple trick. And this is it. Um, let's say you have the value which was your, and you want to represent it, re uh, replace it with your. So what you do is that instead of changing it, you just append something to it. You say, OK, this is actually the new value. But you still need a mutation, because you need to keep track of the head of your list. And in fact, once you get into a concurrent environment, this is what happens, and now what? So you, know, you had your, and you had multiple possible mutations. Which one is the right one? Which one is a canonical one? OK, so how does that relate to blockchain? Well, a blockchain, in essence, is a monadic representation of a mutable state through a series of operations. So for example, for Bitcoin, we have a state, which is a set of unspent outputs, the UTXOs, um, and operations, which are transactions. So when I transact with you on Bitcoin, I'm saying, you know, I could spend this bit of Bitcoin, and now you can spend it instead of me. So this is how we change the state. And generally speaking, any blockchain is going to have a function, apply, um, which takes a state, takes an operation, and gives you a new state. And if the operation is bad, it might be an invalid state, but it's still a state, right? OK, but in general, a blockchain is not a chain, it's a tree, right? You can have, uh, people can add block wherever they want. And so how do we pick a canonical leaf on this tree? Well, the most general way to do that would be to have a well ordering over branches. You would have a function that would just look at two branches, um, and they would say, well, this branch is better than this other branch. But that's inefficient because you have to look at the entire tree uh, in order to do that, and you don't necessarily know the entire tree. So um, what we do in Tezos and in general in this talk, we're going to simplify this a little bit, and we're going to require something a little stronger. We want to want a fitness function, which goes from the state and gives you a fitness score, uh, which is going to be an integer. So for example, I'm going to look at one leaf, and I'm going to ask to this leaf, what is your score? And I'm going to ask that to another leaf, and I'm just going to pick this, whichever leaf has the highest score. OK, so all existing blockchain implementations, Bitcoin, Ethereum, zero cash, you take whatever you want, they all can be subsumed by, one, by this pair. Apply takes a state, takes an operation, gives you a new state. And fitness takes a state and gives you a score. So how do we actually implement fitness? Well, in Bitcoin, uh, the first blockchain, that's the total difficulty of the branch. You look at a branch, you look how much hashing power has gone uh, in the creation of that branch, and that is your difficulty. Uh, some people say it's the length. Of the, uh, of the branch, but that's actually the difficulty of the branch. If you had a centralized model, you could say, well, uh, it's the presence of a trusted third party signature. If I have this signature in the branch, then that's the right branch. And I trust the third party to only sign one branch. And in proof of stake systems, it's a little trickier, but essentially you have a set of rules that are going to um, assign signature rights to some people, and you can validate and count those signatures, and that can give you your score. And there are many, many other models which you can use to actually pick a branch. So where do we get statefulness? Because when we're dealing with uh, mathematical abstractions, uh, when we're dealing with these uh, concepts, there's no state. We need to entangle that with the real world. Right now, anyone can say anything. So 
how is there one consensus that actually corresponds to the world? How do we entangle it with zero of time? And so in Bitcoin, the answer is heat, right? So when you're mining Bitcoin, you actually have mining rigs and they're spending energy, which is costly, and they're dissipating heat. And this is fundamental because if you want to have something um, that's uh, going to be irreversible, you need to have some dissipative process happening in a physical world. Because if you don't, then you're not going to have a tie to the physical world. There's, only, there's going to be all of these possible variants, and no one is going to be canonical. In a centralized model, well, the statefulness is hard-coding authority. Basically, the way that you, fix, you pick a fixed reference point in the world is you say that person, or this group of people, is going to be signing the chain, you know, which are those people specifically. And that's how you get a state. You pinpoint it down in some particular place of the world. And in proof of stake, you get something like social or economic activity, and basically you're trying to bootstrap uh, your reference point based on the social and economic activity that arises around um, the blockchain itself. So when we design a blockchain protocol, there's really three layers that we care about. There's a network layer, and the network layer is essentially the gossip protocol. It's how participants in the protocol learn about blocks, they learn about transactions, they know what's up. There's a consensus layer, which is Okay, we know the blocks, we know the operations, but which branch is canonical? And the transaction layer, which is, okay, we have these operations, what do they actually mean? What do they do to the state? And the network layer is not very controversial, right? If you want to innovate in this layer, if you say, I have a better way of sending out uh, information, you can do that. You can go ahead and do that, and if it's a great way, people are going to follow it, and you can be completely interoperable with everyone else. So network layers, there's a ton of interesting innovation to do it, but it's not very problematic. Now, the consensus layer and transaction layer are a little trickier, especially since if you want to have decentralization, the trick is that you're entangling two and three, right? In Bitcoin, for example, the way you get consensus is because the miners are actually receiving coins out of the Coinbase transaction when they create a block. So you have a mix between the second layer and the third layer. And there's always going to be some form of economic incentives in a decentralized model for participants to actually follow the consensus. And so, okay, so we have this blockchain, but who exactly controls it? Because we don't, you know, if, if, if there's no state, if we don't have a centralized party that actually tells us what the blockchain does, you know, who, who's, who's really in charge? And one answer is that it's the algorithm. And in 2014, you talk to uh, people in the Bitcoin community, and that was a very popular answer. Uh, you would say, okay, but who's in charge of Bitcoin? And it says, no one, it's mass, it's purely mass, you only have to trust the mass. And that's not quite true because, well, we have miners as well. So if the miners in Bitcoin all of a sudden decide they want to buy in a certain different version of Bitcoin, well, then mostly, most likely, you know, you can use the old version, but most likely people are going to follow suit because maybe that branch is more secure, even though it's different. So maybe the miners are in charge. But in fact, the miners are not really in charge because the miners are going to mine the branch they expect other miners to mine. And they don't, they don't necessarily uh, coordinate that well. So are the core developers in charge? Because the core developers tell us, well, this is a protocol. This is the official protocol. This is what you should be following. Well, not necessarily because maybe the core developers disagree. Maybe they don't convince everyone to switch. So is it the stakeholders, the people who hold the coin? And it's really, there's no clear defined answer because there's no uh, governance. So the consensus that you end up having, is the consensus that matters, is actually a social consensus. It's a shelling point. This idea of saying, you know, what is this blockchain to me, what the canonical version of it is to me, is what I expect other people are going to find the canonical version to be. A brief explanation on what shelling points are. So let's say you need to meet someone in Paris, and you, know, you both know the day, but you didn't set a time and place. Right? You, you forgot to do that, and so you want to meet them. Where and where uh, would you meet? Anyone? Eiffel Tower at noon, awesome, you win. <laughs> <laughs> Under the Eiffel Tower at noon, that's right. Uh, and other acceptable answer is train stations. They work in most cities, but Paris has many train stations, so it's not obvious. All right, so most political power today, and most power in general, is held through game theoretical equilibrium. They are held through shelling points. So here's an example. We went from you know, this Viking, you know, Viking chief to uh, Kim Jong-un. And the big difference is that the Viking chief actually holds power because he is very, very strong. And even though he still needs to have a lie, but he's very strong, maybe he can beat up everyone uh, in, uh, in the Viking tribe. Now, Kim Jong-un probably cannot beat up anyone. However, 
So why is, he, why is he more scary than the Viking guy? Well, he's more scary because he has a huge army and he has guards. And if one of the guards try to attack him, the other guards will attack him because they all know that if they don't attack back, then they too will be traitors. And in the end, he doesn't have, the power is not interesting in him. The power is in what he represents. The power is where he sits in the game theoretical equilibrium. Okay, so what do these people have in common? So we have here uh, Goodall, uh, we have uh, Douglas Hofstadter, and we have Peter Suber and the US Constitution. So what's the common thread? Well, um, we have Goodall, who became a US citizen, and when he became a US citizen, he was convinced he found a flaw in the US Constitution, and he really, really wanted to bring it to the attention of the people uh, holding the ceremony to swear him in. And he was convinced not to. And the flaw probably had to do with some of the self-amendments property of the Constitution, where you could take the Constitution and make amendments that would turn it into dictatorship. Uh, Peter Suber is a philosopher. He's now known mostly for his work on uh, open access uh, to um, <clears throat> academic publications. But uh, he also wrote a book called uh, The Paradox of Self-Amendments and a game named Nomic. And the game Nomic was published by Douglas Hofstadter, who is known for coining the term strange loop. So what is Nomic? Well, Nomic is a game, in the words of uh, Peter Suber, Nomic is a game in which changing the rules is a move. In that respect, it differs from almost every other game. The primary activity of Nomic is proposing changes in the rules, debating the wisdom of changing them in that way, voting on the changes, deciding what can and cannot be done afterwards, and doing it. And even the score of the game, of course, can be changed. So why, the, why does he call that a paradox of self amendments Well, it's a so-called veridical paradox where the paradox is actually true. And I don't personally find it very paradoxical, but the idea is you have a set of rules that says that you can change it. Can you change it in a way that says that you can't change it anymore? And the answer is yes. So you can have fully introspective set of rules that can look upon themselves and change themselves. So what does it have to do with the blockchain? Well, I wanted to create a self-amending blockchain. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is that we're going to take this apply and fitness function, because remember, apply and fitness really define what a blockchain is all about. And we're going to take them and fold them inside the state. Then we're going to have operations which can change apply and fitness. And remember, these operations are going to be inside the apply function. Apply function is going to see an operation that changes itself. And now we're going to let also apply introspect into the protocol. So apply is going to be given a new version of the protocol. It's going to look into it, and it's going to decide if it's a valid change of protocol or not. And what we actually get out of this is a genuine strange loop. So why do we want to do this? Well, we want to do this for governance. Because what we were discussing earlier is you know, who controls the blockchain. And to a large extent, controlling the blockchain means being able to change apply and fitness. So who can change apply and fitness? Well, in this version, the person who can control apply and fitness, you could start with something like a simple vote. You could have people say, we're going to vote on a new protocol, and then we'll have the protocol tally the votes, and the protocol which receives the most votes, or if a protocol is selected by a supermajority, we'll just have that protocol and hot swap the protocol. Right? So this is not a case of having people vote, and then someone just implements a change and sends a patch. It happens uh, on the fly. But we can do better than that. When we can vote on the rules, we can vote on different rules as well. And so instead of voting directly, we could say, you know what? Maybe we can have representative democracy. We'll elect certain trusted parties to make decisions. Um, and you know, maybe if we don't believe in that, we can have liquid democracy. Well, we'll be able to change our representants easily. You could instantiate several competing bodies. Um, you could have, and I think that's the most interesting part, something like constitutionalism. So the idea would be, let's say we have a property that we really care about. For example, we never want more than a billion token on uh, this blockchain. Well, what we could do is say, OK, every new protocol must come with a formal proof that it preserves the property we care about, and also that it preserves the amendment. Right? And if we do that, well, OK, we're going to need a proof checker inside the protocol. But we have good proof checkers. And we're going to need a proof. But the proof doesn't have to be that complicated. If you write the code in a way that, where you have a bottleneck, um, and in that bottleneck you enforce the property you want, writing a proof doesn't have to be necessarily bad. So you can have a blockchain. It doesn't have to go into any crazy direction, because a lot of gnomic games you know, go like this. It can actually be fairly conservative and fairly restricted in um, the design decision it makes. Third thing we can do, a uh, future key, instead of, you know, we can say, instead of voting, we'll just run prediction markets, uh, see, what a, see what proposal uh, looks best, and we'll just um, pick that based on the betting odds. OK, why do we want to have governance? You know, why not just keep the blockchain the way it is? 
Well, the first thing is that explicit governance is like having rule of law, right? There's always going to be people who are going to want to change the protocol. And if they don't have a venue to change the protocol, it's always going to be a question of whether or not they're being legitimate. If you force a specific venue for having these changes, then legitimacy is going to be granted by a known process instead of just yelling loudly. So there was a Bitcoin block size debate over the past year where some, some people wanted to have bigger Bitcoin block sizes and have more transaction on the blockchain. And other people said, no, 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 this hurts decentralization. And the problem with these debates, you know, I don't even have a strong view on the debates. Well, my, my, my view is mostly that this should not happen like this. It should not just be who is going to be the most influential and who yells the loudest. And another example we had recently was a Ethereum hard fork. Ethereum hard to hard fork, there was a heist. Um, a smart contract had a bug. Someone used the bug to get $50 million. And then Ethereum said, oh, no, Mulligans, we'll just pretend it didn't happen. We'll just like roll it back. And the problem isn't so much that they did this. The problem is that it was done completely behind closed doors, without involvement of the community, without any process. And so it felt completely arbitrary. What matters isn't so much the rule as the predictability of the rules. We can also reward innovation. So right now, if you have some cool ideas in blockchain space, most people, they just create their own blockchain. And it creates a completely fragmented market. Um, but what we would like to do is incentivize collaboration instead of competition. And so one way to do that is to say, OK, I have this idea for an improvement. So I'll write a new version of the protocol. And I'll submit it. I'll say, OK, here's my amendment. Let's, let's have this new protocol instead. And as part of the protocol, you can say, hey, this is a new protocol. And by the way, I'm going to create new tokens and assign them to myself. And then people say, OK, well, you know, maybe we'll vote for that. You know, it dilutes it a little bit, but it's, it's, it's great for the chain. And of course, you, you could try to vote, you know, to vote for a copy, which doesn't have this issuance of new tokens. But if they do that, it's a repeated game. They would just basically shoot themselves in the foot. They would be sending the signal that there's no point in innovating. And you can solve collective action problem. And I think that's really interesting. Um, maintaining and building infrastructure for the blockchain, evangelizing for it. In general, uh, when people look at blockchain, a lot of people have looked at them as you know, the new database. And they're really not databases. They're not about uh, data. They're about coordination. Um, and I think that's what they are. They're coordination technology. One result I really like in game theory is a result about super Nash equilibrium. So if you have a game, you know, there's always going to be this Nash equilibrium. But Nash equilibrium sometimes sucks. If you have a prisoner dilemma, the Nash equilibrium is that everyone betrays and everyone goes to jail. And it would be so great if they could coordinate. Right? If they could say, OK, no, we're going to make a contract, and then we, bo we, both, we both won't go to jail. Well, it turns out that if you take any game and you allow people to contract and to have self-enforcing contracts, then instead of having Nash equilibrium, the game has super Nash equilibrium. And a super Nash equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium that resists to all contracts all, um, and all uh, allegiances. And the property is that a super Nash equilibrium is actually Pareto optimal. And that's really cool. It means that as long as people are given the chance of making contracts that they can enforce, then they can all be better off. And the way I look at it is you have this landscape, uh, this landscape surface of how bad or good things are. And you can be stuck in a local minimum where Kim Jong-un is, is your boss. But what are we doing with coordination is digging tunnels through the surface. We allow ourselves to leap from a local optimum to a global optimum without having uh, to be shot, by the way, by the other guards. OK, so this is why we're doing governance and how we're doing it. Let me talk briefly about OCaml. So Tezos is implemented from scratch. It's not a clone of any other blockchain in OCaml. Why did I pick OCaml? Well, first of all, uh, OCaml has a formal semantic, almost. Uh, most of OCaml, a very large subset, has a formal semantic. And this is important because the protocol itself becomes something that we reason about. You know, when we make a proposal, the proposal is going to be in the form of OCaml code, and it has to be very unambiguous what we're talking about. The other thing is, you can extract OCaml program from COC. So COC is a uh, serum prover, and uh, also uh, it, it can also search for proofs by itself. And once you find a proof, you can extract an OCaml program out of it, which means that if you want to write protocols which have been really verified, you can write them in COC and extract them to OCaml for performance. Now, the, uh, the alternative would have been to create a DSL would have been to say, OK, you know, I need to have this embedded language where I'm going to describe a protocol, where I'm going to implement apply and fitness. But implementing apply and fitness is a lot of code. And you, know, you, need better, you need good tooling, and you need a high level language. And so rather than create yet another language, I said, well, you know, OCaml is a great way to do that. A little bit about defensive programming as well in OCaml. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with OCaml. This is a very simple example of an OCaml module. Uh, and what I want to illustrate is how OCaml modules give you encapsulation. So here we have a module, tokens, 
with a type T. And type T is abstract. You know there's a type, but you don't know what it is. You know that you can create this type out of an integer, and you have an, an addition operation where you take uh, two elements of type T and you get another one. And here you have the concrete implementation. The concrete implementation tells you that T is an integer. It tells you that the of int function is actually just the identity. You have an integer, you get another integer, and it tells you how to actually implement addition. But what's cool is that once you do that, the rest of the code is only going to sing the signature. So the rest of the code cannot create this type without actually explicitly going through this function. So there's no risk that you're actually going to uh, mistake it with another integer in the code. And also, it's going to completely restrict uh, your surface. Uh, because whenever you have, whenever an object of type token is being accessed, it's being accessed through functions inside this module. So you can control everything that happens to it. So what we did in the code is we build a pyramid of abstraction from the storage. So at the lowest level, we are storing uh, all the objects that we have on the state uh, inside a database. We actually rely on a, a key store value based on Git uh, to do this. And then we build up. We build up with higher and higher abstraction uh, up to the point where we're implementing the apply function and we're using very high level primitives, which absolutely cannot even in principle touch uh, the low level storage. It makes it easier to analyze, and it makes it easier to enforce invariants. And part of the reason was that we were building this with a small team. We were building it from scratch. It is really uh, hard to ensure that you're not making uh, bugs when you're writing something like this. And so we wanted to have a style of programming where we could be very confident um, in the safety of the code. Now let me talk a little bit about smart contracts. Now every blockchain uh, tool used to have these smart contracts. So what are they? Well, a smart contract is a piece of code representing and enforcing a contractual agreement over the conditions under which a shared global state may be altered. Okay, so for example, let's say you have some type of wallet on a blockchain with some tokens. You might want a protected account. You might say, okay, you know, maybe I'm drunk and maybe I spend them and I don't want to spend them, or maybe someone steals it. So you would set some rules and say, okay, I can only spend them on this day or by this amount or at this rate. You can set rules. You could have a swap. You could tell, okay, I want to exchange tokens with you under certain conditions by certain amounts for a certain period of time. Or you could have voting. You could have a smart contract where you receive signatures, aggregate the signatures, count votes, and change the state of the blockchain based on that. So how do we implement a language for a smart contract? Well, the usual approach when implementing a new language seems to be, first you create or you pick an existing virtual machine. You'll say, okay, I'll pick the Erlang virtual machine or the JVM. Then you build your high level language and you compile it down to the virtual machine. And then that's great because you get just in time compilation for free. You get a ton of libraries. This is fantastic. Except for smart contracts, this is dangerous. Why? Because first, you need a formal specification of the VM. This is what you're going to record. It's going to record an agreement. You want to make really sure that everyone agrees what the VM is supposed to do. Second, you need a formal specification of the high-level language. You need to make sure that you understand what it actually does. And more importantly, you also need a formally verified compiler. You need to have a compiler that guarantees that the semantic you have in the high-level language is also going to carry over to the low-level language. And so that's difficult. But I think also one more important point is that if you don't have that, then all you have inside the blockchain is going to be this virtual machine code. And it's really hard to make proofs about the virtual machine code. Now you might say, OK, well, if your contract you know, can have a formal proof of correctness in a high-level language, why can't I just you know, take that proof? That means there's a proof in a low-level language. But that's not quite true. When we reason about high-level abstractions, it's much easier than reasoning about low-level abstraction. Right? So in theory, if a proof exists for one, it exists for the other. In practice, it's really hard. So one of my favorite examples is a pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle says you have 101 pigeons, you have 100 holes. Can you put the pigeons in holes so that no hole has more than two pigeons? And of course you can't because you have more pigeons than you have holes, right? But if you take this, uh, if you take this problem, which is really about arithmetic, and you turn it into a problem of, about Booleans, about a sat uh, satisfiability problem in Boolean, and you just look at it in Boolean logic, any proof is going to have to be exponential in size. So you turn a problem which was very simple into a problem which is going to be now extremely gnarly to prove. Why? Because you've dropped the theory of arithmetic, which is a very valuable theory. And if you were presented this problem in this very low level, you would have to basically reinvent arithmetic in order to get a concise proof. So whenever you go from a high-level abstraction to a low-level abstraction, you lose important theorems about your data. 
And this is why SMT methods have been so successful, uh, satisfiability modulo theory, their methods which analyze programs and trying to find how to get into a certain branch of the program. And what they did was, instead of saying, let's compile down everything to Booleans, they actually keep the structure. So it's, I think it's very important when we have a smart contract language that we can reason directly about the contract that's being written about. And so we need this contract to be written in a high level language. What do we care about? We care about correctness. You know, you want your contract to be correct. You don't want it to be something you don't want to do. But you also want it to be verifiable. The other side must know that it's not being cheated, must actually trust you enough that they can verify the behavior of the contract. You want parsimony because, well, this is recorded on a ledger that's going to be replicated everywhere. So space is at a premium. Performance and portability, you don't care about that much. Why? Because you're not running protein folding. You're running simple business logic. There's no point in trying to optimize the performance of that. The number of cycles you need to do most useful cases is very small. Portability. You're going to be running interpreted anyway. You're going to be running on one of a few implementations of a blockchain. You don't need to be running everywhere. And if you do, you can just write an interpreter. So I'm not saying that performance and portability have no value, but they definitely should not be a priority. So, Let's look at Solidity. So Solidity is a language, a high-level language uh, for Ethereum. It kind of looks like JavaScript, but with more types. Now, the problem is Solidity compiles to EVM. EVM is hard to reason about because it's this assembly language. The EVM compiler is non-deterministic, so you can't even know if your ETM code actually matches the code that you wrote in, uh, in Solidity. There's no spec of the EVM. There's no spec of Solidity. Now, people, when they saw bugs happen with Solidity, say, well, this is because the theorem is Turing complete. That's the problem. Because Rice theorem, we cannot predict anything about Turing complete programs. But that's not, a, that's not the issue. That's not the issue because you can have programs in, in non Turing complete languages which are impossible to analyze, and you'll have problems as well. And likewise, you can have programs in Turing complete languages which are easy to analyze because they don't make use of weird features. You know, if you write your program in a straightforward way, it doesn't have to be that you can't make a proof about it. So what really matters is how easy can you reason about a program, not whether it's Turing complete or not. So the language we designed for uh, Tezos is called Mikkelsen. It's inspired by CAT, uh, which is, I think, now a defunct project. CAT was a stack-based, uh, statically typed uh, functional languaging program. So we're also stack-based because I think it enables concision. And we don't typically need a ton of local variables when writing uh, smart contracts. It has high-level primitives, maps, sets, lambdas. We want as many high-level primitives in it because it makes you more concise and it's easier to reason about. And it's statically and strongly typed. And one of the cool things is that the type checking is done by OCaml itself. So we're not running the OCaml runtime. It's just that the object inside OCaml is built with the GADT. And when you create the object, you cannot create the object representing the program in a way that it will not type check. The only way to construct it is to have well-typed programs. So for the contract model itself, this is how we do it. We have a contract, it contains tokens, a type function, and a piece of mutable data. Then we have transactions. Transactions are going to take tokens, and they're going to transfer them, but they're also going to contain an input to the contract function where you're sending the tokens and the message. And the function themselves can send new transactions. So think a little bit about small talk, uh, where the transactions are actually messages. You have messages between these different contracts which carry a mutable state, and they change its state, and they send new messages as a result. So one famous model is a TX out model. That's a model in Bitcoin. And the main difference in a TX out model is that instead of sending new transaction, instead of computing what transaction you want to send, you only compute what would be a valid transaction. You say, OK, I have a piece of code that tells me is a transaction valid instead of what transaction should I make. And there's been a lot written about the differences between the two models. They are isomorphic. One thing you can do with one model, you can do with the other, right? Uh, one is not safer than the other. If you have a safety bug in one, you have a safety bug in the other. The only difference is that the model that sends transactions by itself can be automated a little better. You don't have to be running a server uh, to do the same thing. That is the one difference. Um, there's no other difference. You can turn one into the other. Now, let's talk a little bit about reentrancy bugs. So there was this project called the DAO on Ethereum. And the DAO raised $150 million. They were going to be this kind of like distributed VC firm in making investments. But they had a bug. And the bug was the following. 
You could go on the DAO contract and say, you know what, I'm done with this, I want to take my funds and go. So you could call a split function. And when you call a split function, it will send you your tokens to a refund address. But here's the thing, every address is also a function in Ethereum, like in Tezos. And so once you receive this refund, the, it would trigger code and the code would ask for the refund again. And the contract getting the refund we know yet that the refund has been processed, and it would send the refund again and again and again and again. And so the person asking for a very small refund was able to drain $50 million. So what do you learn from that? Well, beware of side effects. You know, when you're writing uh, in the middle of a contract, when you're writing to uh, your, uh, your storage, you are writing to a global variable. This is dangerous. This is not a good practice. So what can we do instead? Well, Tezos uses continuing, continuation passing style with syntactic sugar. So the first idea was to say, okay, we don't want to have any side effects inside our function. We want very pure function. So instead of sending transaction inside our function, we're going to return that. At the end of our function, we'll return whatever transaction we want to get. And if we want to be called back, we will actually give the callback as a parameter to the contract that we're calling. Well, that can be cumbersome because it would be nice in the middle of our code to be able to call another contract, get the result, and then continue what you were doing. So what we're doing instead is you send a transaction, but whenever you send a transaction, you have to commit the entire new state of your contract. And then you can continue. But it forces you to do that. And by forcing you to do that, it forces you to say, oh, well, hang on. You know, I have a variable that tells me if the refund has been processed, and I need to set this variable before I call any other transaction. And if you do that, you're not going to go into reentrancy bugs. OK, so let me give a quick summary. Tezos is a self-amending ledger. We are self-amending because we care about governance. We want to get good governance and good innovation. We're written purely in OCaml. It was written completely from scratch because OCaml gives us good defensive programming and gives us a strong platform for uh, defining what is a protocol. And we design our smart contract language with verifiability in mind. A lot, one strong assumption of the project is that formal verification um, is about to become ripe for this type of application. Formal verification, which makes formal proofs about programs, for the longest time, it wasn't very practical. You couldn't, pry, uh, you couldn't uh, verify concrete problems. But now we have all of these contracts. They have a few lines of code, and there's $150 million worth of value behind it. It's a perfect candidate for formal verification, but it's not being done yet. So what's the road ahead? Well, um, we need to work on these two things really hard before we launch. Uh, DOS prevention is tricky, uh, especially when we have uh, the type of proof-of-stake model that uh, Tezos has developed, and consensus is hard. Um, and if you break either of the two, your network crashes. Most other problems, if you have bad design, if you're slow, all of these things you can fix because we have an amendment process. But the things that we cannot fix easily with amendments are these two things. So that's what we're working on hardest. But we also we would like more eyes looking at the code. So the code is available on github.com. Tezos slash uh, Tezos. And it's not open source yet. You can run the code, you can look at it, but it's not an open source license yet. We're still looking into what license we want to use, and it will be released under a uh, free open source license uh, in Q1 2017. And in the longer run, we want a cool feature. Well, we want to build in a proof checker in the protocol so that we could have constitutional amendments. Uh, we want to build a declarative language for smart contracts so that we don't even have to write proofs so that the contract can be self proving. And we would like to develop a snark library um, because snarks, they're a very cool uh, cryptographic construct that can give us privacy, but also a lot of compression uh, ability in, uh, in the software. All right, uh, this is my talk about Tezos, and uh, I'll take some questions. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the least appreciated aspects of Bitcoin is how well it deals with spam, right? In Bitcoin, if I come and tell you, hey, here's a better chain here, here's a better version, you can check that very quickly. All you need to do is count the zeros in a bunch of hashes. You don't need to download blocks. You need to do very, very little work to say, nope, that's not right. And for you to fake it would be extremely expensive. In a proof of stake system, dealing with spam is harder because someone could say, hey, here's this very long chain. And if you check it, you will see at the end the fitness will be really high, 
right? So you have to architect yourself so that you can reject that. I, we can reject that very, very quickly. You want to be able to download very few blocks and be able to say, nope, that chain is lying, and that affects that. That consideration affects a lot the design of the algorithm itself. But it's and it's still constant time. It's still going to take you asymptotically the same time it would take with Bitcoin. But you actually need to download a block. You need to analyze what it does. So it's a little trickier. So that, that comes with using proof of stake as a DOS issue? The DOS issue comes with proof of stake, yes. Yes? So are you going to have a methodology to deal with accumulation of those amendments over time, which would snowball the complexity of verification? So the verification done by the amendments, it only happens at the moment where you actually submit a new protocol, which is not going to be a very common event. You know, maybe like if there's a protocol a year, that would be a lot. Uh, okay, so the clever way you... I see. So the question is, how do we deal with an accumulation of amendments? If we have a ton of amendments, it becomes really impossible to upgrade the system. So the trick is to be careful when you pass an amendment. So there are certain things you should do. You shouldn't have really hard amendments, right? You should probably say, this is an amendment, and you need to abide by it unless maybe you get an 80% majority to say it's fine. So you need to have a procedure for repealing amendments. That would be wise. You could also add sunset clauses in most of your amendments so that you're guaranteed that you don't get stuck for too long. The worst case scenario, right? The worst case scenario, if you get stuck, well, you don't have to go through the system. If you get stuck, you can hard fork. But why can't we hard fork all the time? Well, we, if we hard fork all the time, then we get the problem of knowing who's right and what to follow. So the procedure is really about giving legitimacy to one fork rather than another one. But if you're doing something outside of the system, right? If we have a, a good procedure for changing governance and you say, no, 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 let me ignore that procedure and hard fork, you're going to be suspicious. People are going to say, well, why, why do you want to do that? Why don't you go through the system? You're not going to get the shelling point. However, if the system is stuck and you say, well, this is stuck, here's a protocol that will unstuck it, then you can propose a hard fork because you have an obvious reason for doing so, right? You're not obviously evil. Yeah? What parts are applicable to a permission blockchain? What parts are applicable to a permission blockchain? Uh, good question. Well, I think that permission blockchain very often are solving a political problem. Uh, you have a lot of players, and in theory, they could have the technology for dealing with their issue, but by pushing a blockchain on them, it kind of solves the, the problem of saying who's in charge, right? You don't want to have anyone in charge. And I think that applies to governance as well, because you, you know, uh, a permission blockchain needs governance just as much as a regular blockchain needs governance. And so in theory, you could have off-chain governance. You could say, well, we'll create this body, and this body will govern it, and so on and so forth. But you won't get as much flexibility in these governance rules as you would uh, on a blockchain. And it might be tricky, especially if you have a permission blockchain, let's say for a bank use case where you have banks all around the world, it gets really, really difficult in practice to actually have these uh, governing bodies. And you can, you can look at it in um, some of the other permission systems which are out there, which don't really have explicit governance and aren't able to be very nimble. You know, look at the internet. The internet is actually permission. Uh, and the internet has a very hard time actually upgrading itself. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right, so does it make it harder or does it prevent it completely? It, it makes it very hard. So if you want to have a reentrancy bug, you know, some person's bug is another person's feature, right? So if you want to have a reentrancy bug, you can, but it makes it very, very obvious that the bug is here. And you also have a protection. If you want to disable reentrancy completely, you can say no reentrancy because you can actually control the stack uh, inside, the, um, inside the execution of the contract. You can see who your callers are. So if you don't want to have any reentrancy, which probably you don't want by default, you can just deactivate that. But I think even more interesting than that is the ability to change the language itself. You know, we have amendments. If we find that there are some cool features we want the language to have that prevents more bugs, we can actually upgrade the language. Yes? So, so what is the initial governance model? What's really important with the initial governance model is not that it's perfect, but that it is in the right basin of attraction 
so that we get into a virtuous cycle where we get better and better uh, systems instead of worse and worse, right? And the initial model that I have is you have a set schedule for uh, voting, which at first will be fairly often, maybe every three months, and then it has an exponential decay on the lens uh, at which it uh, happens uh, all the way to one year. And we have a 60% majority needed with a 60% quorum. And the quorum itself is exponentially decreasing based on the quorum of previous elections so that you don't get stuck. So I think 60% and 60% is fairly conservative, but if people don't feel it's conservative enough, I trust that the first election would actually raise that quorum. Yes? In a nutshell, what's open to amendment and what is Well, that's a paradox of self-amendments. In a nutshell, everything is open to amendment. So things you can change. You can change a consensus algorithm, right? You can change the fitness function. So if you say, you know what, this proof of stake thing is not really working for us, the risk of DDoS is too high, you can switch to a proof of work system, or you can switch to a centralized system. So consensus is completely in scope. Uh, if you want to say, you know what, we want Bitcoin, you can turn the entire thing into a complete clone of Bitcoin and have that. Um, so really, the thing that is not, uh, that you don't have uh, governance over is a network layer. And the reason for that is that network layer works. Like people can innovate and there's, no, there's really no conflict on the network layer. Yes, it's time. All right, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>